Good morning. How y'all doing? You enjoying this winter whiplash we got going on here? Wasn't it, didn't it hit like 70 degrees on Friday? Didn't it? Was I just imagining that? It's like I'm reaching for my sunglasses and the SP30 and winter comes back in like a Catholic school nun with a ruler and stuff. <laughs> Not so fast, Whitey. <laughs> You're going to have to wear pale skin and dark, heavy clothes for a little bit longer. So, um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. But uh, anyway, uh, glad to be here. Sorry for the people who couldn't quite get out of bed this morning. I, you know, it's crazy because usually the time change Sunday is the day that people are coming in sheepishly an hour late, you know, and or, or discover that it's what the time that they thought was that they, sh they should be leaving for church is an hour uh, that hour has passed, and then they just don't show up at all. But the little bit of rain comes down, and people go, oh, I'm just going to stay home in my jammies. <laughs> so if you're watching online today, I know you. I, I, I see you. I understand. I understand you, too. <laughs> yes, very much so. All right, so um, we are going to jump back into this message that we talked about, the recovery of good. We started this last Sunday, and... Um, and uh, so what I said last Sunday is that we, were, we dealt with what is the recovery of good, and then today, or what good, what good is being recovered. And this week, we're going to talk about how that good is being recovered. So get into a little bit more practical stuff, but we have a lot of stuff to, to cover. I was talking to my wife who's been in, she's gallivanting again. Uh, she's in Virginia now. She comes home tomorrow, so I'm happy about that. Uh, but... Um, yeah, so she's, uh, I was talking to her on the phone um, last night, and uh, she says, so how's your message coming together? And I said, I'm over-preparing, is typical. And uh, so if I, I have to stop myself at some point from continuing to study and work on messages because they will become like four-hour, uh, you know, um, discussions. So, uh, in fact, I told you that this was like a two-parter. It should have been like six. So, yeah, it should have been six. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you the notes. How's that? <laughs> All right. So let's pray, and we'll dig right in and read some scripture together. We're going to go back to Colossians chapter one, and um, and discover how we recover the good that God has in mind for us. Jesus, we do submit ourselves to you, to your lordship, to your grace and your kindness. We thank you for all of those things, Lord, that uh, secure our steps and our path, that guide us, and uh, we ask for that guidance today. We ask for our hearts to be yielded, to be uh, malleable, pliable, so that you might be able to speak truth into our hearts according to the scripture. And uh, Lord, would you undo any, anything that needs to be unlearned in us today, and would you establish your truth, your, your um, pleasure, Lord, as our guide today. And uh, so we submit ourselves to this high and holy work again this morning, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the salvation of the good news of the gospel we talked about last week is it includes us in God's pleasure. So the good that God stamped on every piece of creation through six days created and at the end of that creation looked at it and said, it is what? It's good. So he did that for six days. On the sixth day, he looked at everything he had made before he took the seventh day, the Sabbath, of a day of rest. He looked at everything he made and he said, it's very good. So we talked about that word as being a weird word, that it doesn't really seem to like capture the, the uh, grandeur of this creation, right? But um, the, the, uh, the word good means that it, in the eyes of God, it's right and that it gives him pleasure. So that's what God's after in our lives is to restore those things that have been broken. So God is concerned about the improvement of your life, but his primary work of the gospel is through Jesus, that great doorway for us to include us again in the pleasure of God. So then we looked at... So we're doing some recapping here. So we looked at how that sin separates our relationships from God, from ourselves, from our true identity as image bearers of God. 
and our relationship with others. And God is moving us away from non-good. So that's what Adam and Eve introduced into humanity by choosing to disbelieve God and disobey God. So if that was the, the doorway through which we entered into non-good, what's going to be the way of access for us back into the goodness of God? More faith, more obedience. Amen. Learning to trust God more, learning to obey what God says is good and right and brings him pleasure. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what we covered last week. So good is defined by God, how he created things to be. The aim of the gospel is to allow people to recover good. And um, so what is that recovery of good? The outcome of the fruit produced in a person who believes the gospel has much more to do with an alignment with what God wants and what pleases him than what it does with our satisfaction of our wants. So how does that recovery happen? Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read not as much of that chapter as we did last week. We're going to start in verse 3. So Paul has, in the first two verses, has introduced himself. He's, he's addressed the people, given them blessings, his introductory blessings. And then in verse 3, we catch up with it. He says, we always pray for you. And we, give God, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And we talked about that last week, that those are the earmarks, right, where we see the gospel's impact in people's lives. There's an increase of faith and that in, in people's lives, and there's an increase of love for other people. Those two things are going to be characteristic of the impact of the gospel. Verse 5, those things, your your faith and love for all of God's people, they come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. So it's not just that you've heard a good news message, but there's truth, there's content, and we talked about that last week. The content of the good news um, is, um, is the object of that, of, of what Paul's talking about here. They come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. Verse 7, you learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker, he is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about your, the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, then the way that you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. And we also pray that you would be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have the, all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the, in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Amen? Amen. Let's go back to verse 6. He says, this same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understand the truth about God's wonderful grace. So what's the fruit of this gospel? It is a, it's the evidence of a deepening faith in God and a greater submission to obey or do what aligns with God's will and what pleases him. This emphasis on fruit creates an expectation. When the Bible uses the word fruit, it means that there's the evidence of something. Something's been planted, something's been developed, and out of that development, fruit. There's a manifestation of what that plant is producing, right? So there's John the, or, uh, John the Baptist taught, told the Pharisees, you need to produce fruit that's in keeping with your repentance. They were coming down and pretending that they were uh, uh, you know, believing in the Messiah and that they were changing their lives. But he says, you need to produce the evidence. You say, I'm repenting, but where's the evidence of that? So 
Paul here says that there's an evidence of our salvation. There's an evidence of the impact of the gospel on our lives. That emphasis on fruit creates an expectation. Your life should be changed. It should be different from the people who are faithless and disobedient to God. And this different must be expressed in a way that's observable by others. Well, we need to just sit, chill there for just a second, right? Because people say, well, I just have a faith in God, and it's just my personal faith, and I'm going to live and let live, and I'm just going to, other people are going to do what they're going to do, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and it really doesn't matter. No, it really matters, yeah. right? It really matters. The way that you live out your faith matters. Yeah. It matters because that's the evidence. That's the observable fruit, the evidence that other people can see that the impact of the salvation is real and genuine in your life. If it's not, if your life is not producing that kind of fruit, you need to question whether you're saved. My goodness. My goodness. I didn't think you were going to be here today, and I knew my wife wasn't going to be here because she's in Virginia, and so I thought, I got all kinds of freedom just to say whatever I want to say, and now you're here. I still got it. Okay. All right. All right. This change happens as a result of a sudden miraculous event where God calls our spirit back to life and gives us a new heart. That's what Ezekiel says, right? That God says, I'm going to take that heart of stone out of you, that heart that's rebellious and hardened. It's not inclined to me at all. I'm going to take that out of you, and I'm in salvation, I'm going to put into you what? A heart of flesh. I'm going to, I'm going to put in a heart that, that longs for me and that desires me, right? Desires to do my will. I'm going to put that heart in you. That's the transformation that's promised in salvation. We get that blessing by saying yes to Jesus, by placing our faith, taking our trust off of, off of myself or off of other things, other people, and putting that trust for God's good work in Christ. And in the moment that I place that faith and trust, there's something, faith and trust in Christ, there's something miraculous and sudden and instantaneous that happens. My spirit that was dead to God becomes alive. Right? So there's a, there's a heart change that's promised in salvation that's sudden and instantaneous. God will always respond instant, with instant rewards when faith is expressed toward him. He will. Always. But there's another side of salvation. And that's a slow process of turning. Because when you said yes to Jesus at whatever place of life, whether you were as a little kid growing up in Sunday school, or whether you were a teenager who went to a youth camp and gave your heart to Christ, or whether you're an adult who's lived most of your life and came to the end of yourself and said, man, I need something, I need God in my life. Whatever place of life that you came to where you said yes to Jesus and you placed your faith in him, you began in a process, you didn't, you didn't, um, the, the primary elements of the way you think, the, the way you thought, the way the things that you valued, the way that you perceived life, your perceptions, your, your perspectives, all of that needed to undergo ongoing change. Right? So you didn't get saved and suddenly, oh, I'm thinking spiritually all the time. Not by a long shot. I know some of y'all. Not by a long shot. Right? And, and more than that, I know me. So there's a process of observable change. Another part of that salvation is a process of observable change that is a result of conversion, where the way that we think, the things that we value, and the way that we live are turned from one way to another. And speaking of turning something one way to the other, I was telling Pastor Chris before the service today, I said, I need to find a, I, I, I want to find a, um, a sideways tablet, yeah, a landscape tablet. So I just kind of made it. I'm praying that the sticky stuff will make it stay. All right. So, um, so hang with me for a little bit because we're just going to dig dig deep for a bit, right? So, faith and acceptance—that's the doorway to get into God's 
in, in, to be included in his blessings. So God says, you are saved uh, th- by faith through grace, right? So there's, a, there's an access into the favor and the goodness of God, into the blessings of God that comes by faith alone. So faith and acceptance lead us into or, br- or make our spirits alive. But then we are, that occurs somewhere on a process, a timeline of conversion. That's what this word is for those of you sitting in the far back. Conversion. To understand this, we need to go to Acts chapter 26, and we're going to read where Paul is standing before King Agrippa. This is toward the end of Paul's life, and he is now, um, he's giving a defense. King Agrippa is interested in, okay, so what what have you been doing? He's on trial for causing a stir in the, um, the, the Jews want to have him killed, the Romans want him out, or they, they really don't care about Paul, but, uh, but the Jews are demanding that Paul be held accountable for what he's doing, and so he stands before King Agrippa, and he's giving this defense. He's telling the story to Agrippa about his conversion, about his experience of meeting Christ on the road to Damascus, where he's knocked off of his, his donkey or horse, whatever he was on, He's knocked off onto the ground, he's, he's blinded, and he has this conversation with Jesus. And Jesus, that's where Jesus asked him that question, how, how hard is it for you to kick against the goads, Paul? Right? So the goad is a, star, a sharp, pointy stick. And he says, you're kicking against it, and it's hurting you every single day. How long are you going to do that before you realize that there's another way to go? Why, why, why are you opposing me, is what Jesus is asking Paul. Paul thinks he's doing God's will, but he's really opposing Christ. So, but at verse 17, Paul says that this is what Jesus said to me. He says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Verse 18, this is what Paul's, this is what Jesus said Paul was to do, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So conversion is that process of being turned from darkness, so dark thinking, dark understandings, living under the power of Satan, to being brought into light and where you're living under the power of God. And so Jesus told Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, to, to, to your own people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles, and I'm sending them, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and to help turn them. Right? So all of us kind of live on this pivot. What's that thing in the middle of a, of a table that spins around? Lazy Susan. I, would you think Susan was like unhappy about that? Yesterday, I think Susan would be highly offended at that. Yeah, it's not lazy at all. Okay. <laughs> so there's, there's that spinny platey thing in the middle of the table called a lazy Susan. Forgive us, Susans of the world, right? So, um, so um, all of us in our lives just kind of sit on this pivot place, right, to where we are looking as, as unbelievers, as people who have come in, not come into relationship with Jesus, trusted in him. We're looking at darkness. We are living under the power of Satan. Yes? And so over time, and for some of us, it's like a pretty rapid process to where we start turning toward God. We're hearing, a, a, you know, we're... We, we go to a church service on Easter and we hear the gospel preached there or, or we hear a sermon on TV or we're driving through uh, Nebraska and listening to radio stations and we hear a TV preacher uh, talking uh, about the gospel. We have a friend, a coworker, uh, someone who shares the gospel with us. We're and it's sitting in a dirty Motel 6 in Wichita, Kansas and we look at the, uh, the Gideon's Bible that's in the nightstand, Right? So all of those things are producing, as as we are encountering them, they're producing a shift, a change, where we're not seeing just complete darkness anymore. Now I'm seeing kind of shadows 
of light. I'm not seeing under, I'm not understanding everything there is to know, but I know that there's more light this direction, and I'm going to keep investigating, right? So some of you came to Christ early on in the process. So I would call you uh, early believers or trusters. Let's say that, early trusters. You're not very skeptical. You're the kind of people that you sit and you watch a magic show and it's like, it's magic, right? And right sitting right next to you is a person who's saying, I'm looking for the smoke and the mirrors. I don't trust any of this stuff. It's not magic, right? So there's early trusters. Those are people who trust easily, who believe, who have a, a capacity to believe in things that they can't see with their eyes. And then down here are people who are uh, skeptics. How many of you were early believers? It's easy for you to believe things that you can't see, right? How many of you are skeptics? Yeah. So it's not quite half, right? But a lot of you are skeptics. So it took some persuasion. It took a lot of encounters with the gospel or with people sharing their faith with you or you reading portions of scripture or reading a block or some, something like that. It took a lot of encounters to help you in this process of turning away from darkness and toward the power of God. Paul would show up in cities and he preached. In some cities, he preached for three years. And he talked to the same people. He would defend the faith. He would, de he would debate with people about the existence of God and about the work of Christ, about religion, false religions. And some of those people sat under Paul's teaching, his preaching, for probably two and a half years before they finally said, okay, I believe. Because they're skeptical. And other people came in really early. It's like, oh yeah, this is great. Sometimes these early trusters are people who are coming out of crisis in their life. I had a person ask me that last week. It's like, well, isn't there something in self-interest that leads us to Christ? And yes, there is. People come out of, out of great desperation. Their life is literally coming apart at the seams, and they come running to Christ because I need help right now, right? So that's going to be an early truster. But the point is, that no matter where you come in on this timeline, there's things that have already been, that have been happening, right? There's already things that have been happening in your life. Remember we talked about that last week, that God, when he banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, he didn't go, okay, you guys are cut off and I'm not gonna talk to you anymore. You gotta get your act together and then we can have a conversation. No, he still stayed in communication with Adam and Eve, right? It's not his will that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's going to be actively involved in the most vile um, sinner on the planet. Doing what? Trying to help them in this conversion from darkness to light to move from the power of Satan to the power of God. And that turning process is going to start before they come and they place their faith in Christ and faith and acceptance. And here's, here's the... I don't want to say bad news, but the, the other news, it's going to continue on afterwards. I've been following Jesus for over 40 years. And there's still times where I'm pivoting back, right? I'm not losing my faith. I'm not rejecting Christ, but I'm starting to entertain ideas and philosophies that belong to the world that are starting to influence and crowd darkness back into my thinking, Right? There's temptations and behaviors all the time that as you sit on this lazy Susan of life, right, that are going to help, or they're going to influence to pivot you back toward darkness or toward God. So let's pay attention to the things that move us toward light, that move us under more under God's authority. Let's pay attention and work on those things. Let's, let's in, in, invest ourselves in those. And that's why the scripture is so um, filled with all these instructions about knowing God, understanding his will, pursuing him, seeking him, grounding yourself in what you've believed. Why? Because you're in this process of turning from darkness to light. And if you want to continue toward the light, to where more of your life is under the authority and the power of God, to where more of your thinking is filled with God's knowledge and his wisdom and his insight, 
then keep turning that way. Yes? Does that make sense? So sometimes we think about salvation just in this, okay, well, I was not a believer, and now I'm a believer. And, and there's an instantaneous, I don't want to, you lose sight of that. There's an instantaneous, miraculous event, no matter where it happened with an early truster or a skeptic in their life, no matter when or where that happened, God met you at your faith. Yes? And he made you alive in Christ. He changed your heart at that very instant. But that was on a continuum of, of conversion. And that continuum of, of conversion is going to continue to happen. That's why it's continuum, right? It's going to continue ha happening until you go meet Jesus. Does that make sense? So... Paul said, this is, this is what I've been called to do. And this is really the, part, the process of the church. This is evangelism in the church. And you're going to talk to people and you're going to share the gospel with people that you're not going to see any results. I was having a conversation with Mike Harmon just before the service today and talking about the, the work that he does with inmates and he's done in prisons and, and, and some of the things that you just, you don't, you never know in the moment of sharing your faith or helping someone to understand more about God or testifying about what God's done for you. You never know what that's going to produce in that person's life because you seldom see it in the moment. Why? Because they're in this process of conversion. And your role in their life, your prayer in that moment, your testimony to them, your sharing of the gospel, your, your encouragement is going to be a part of that process that at some point, whether they're an early truster or they're a way skeptical person, that's going to produce its own fruit. Yes? All right, so access to God's grace is simple. Call on him. Faith expressed toward God will be instantaneously rewarded. Yes? But by focusing only on the sudden event of being born again, it can cause us to lose sight of the process of turning or conversion. And that, in some cases, has preceded, or in most cases, has preceded our salvation, but it certainly for all of us continues after our salvation. This is, this is Christian Life 101, folks. It is. But we are, I, I think we have gotten more sophisticated than we need to be about our faith and following of Jesus. This is basics. And we need to get back to the basics. Yes? So back to verse 6, it says the gospel is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard it and understood, understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. And i got to check the time, and so I'm going to skip this next section. I'll, give the, I'll send those to you because it's really good. It's really, really good. All right. <laughs> so, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's go on to verse 9. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul and the other writers of New Testament letters put specific emphasis on the need to fortify and grow in God's saving work by knowing God's will and developing spiritual understandings. We are today, sadly, in a culture that is rejecting or resisting information and seeking experience. Right? So that's our culture. So people so everywhere from students on school campuses, whether that be in elementary school, all the way up to our universities, they're resisting being instructed. I don't want to be instructed. They want to live out their experiences. So that's happening. That's rampant in our culture, but it's also becoming rampant in the church where people are resistant to instruction and desirous of experiences. So that appetite is fighting the very things that keep and help faith and obedience to take root and to grow in our lives. I, um, I came across this, uh, that surprising book facts that showed up on my Facebook or LinkedIn feed over the last couple of days. In fact, I sent it to my daughter, Caitlin, because I, she helped me a lot with the publishing of my book last year. And so I sent it to her and I said, 
why in the world am I writing books? Because this is the deal. Surprising book facts. 33% of high school graduates never read another book for the rest of their lives. 33%. 42% of college grads never read another book after college. 57% of new books are not read to completion. That's been my experience with my book. I talk to people all the time. Oh, yeah, I just finished the introduction. And you've had it for like six months. What in the world are you doing? It aggravates me if you can't tell, right? 70% um, of U.S. adults have never been in a bookstore in the last five years. 80% of U.S. families did not buy or read a book in the last year. So that's present in our culture. We are, uh, we are moving away from a reading, a learning culture, and it's impacting the church. And we have to recover the heart of a learner. What did Paul say? He says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. This is back in verse 9. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. How will you know God's will apart from your feelings? How will you develop an understanding and discernment about spiritual truth, perspectives, and meaning? You don't do that sitting binge-watching Netflix. You don't do that walking around in nature and thinking, oh, God's everywhere. You don't even do that listening to worship music 24-7. You do that by having an inclination to learn. I want to know what God thinks, and I want to think his thoughts after him. Verse 10. Then the way that you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. That first phrase, he says, then you will live in ways that honor and please the Lord. That walking, uh, that talks about our lifestyle. These behaviors need to honor, our behaviors need to honor and please God if they are going to align with what God has called good. Um, and then the second phrase, it says, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. This fruit is different than the evidence of your conversion. As Paul talked about in verse 6, this fruit has to do with the good or blessings our actions create in the world for the benefit of others. So that's the secondary effect of being saved. And this process of conversion is that as I become more familiar with God's will, God's will is going to be less about self-aggrandizement self-indulgence, and it's going to be about how does my life impact the lives of others for good? What do I do that's making a difference for someone else? Because that's the heart of Jesus. That's the heart of the Father. So there's the fruit of our, the evidence of our, of our uh, faith in Christ that is a deepened relation or deepened faith in Christ and a increase of our willingness to obey what God says that is the evidence of the gospel. But then in this context, he says, let your, your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. This fruit is the fruit of your actions. What do you do that helps other people? And then the last phrase, just in that one verse, see, this could have been like a whole sermon just in verse six, anyway, or verse nine. Um, wherever we are, 10. We're 10. Okay. The third phrase, all the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Everything, everything, everything anchors back to this foundation, knowing God better, knowing more about him, knowing what he wants, knowing what he loves, knowing what he values, knowing what he delights in or what pleases him. Everything anchors back to that. And then we'll end up here in verse 11. I think we're doing okay. I think we're okay. Okay, I'll take a breath. All right, verse 11. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his, God's glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. 
there's a critical process that's involved in the recovery of good, and particularly in this process of conversion, that will involve your tolerance, your ability to tolerate stress and emotional pain. Because there's going to come a conflict. With every decision that, that you make in order to please God, there's going to be a conflict because it's going to come in, at, at, in odds with what people believe you should do. It's going to come in odds with your own flesh, with your own thinking, your dark thinking, right? Your dark coping. Some of you still live in dark coping. When stress comes, you go to chocolate, right? When you experience emotional pain, you try to figure out how to, to um, impulsively fix it or how to numb it away. Is that right? So that's part of dark coping. That's part of a way of dealing with distressing situations that we just want it to go away and we don't know how to live in them. There was a study, fascinating study, that was done on um, people who were dependent on marijuana. So they had smoked pot long enough to where they develop a dependency on that chemical. And so these researchers put this group of people, in, the group of people who wanted, who said, I want to stop using pot. I want to break this addiction. So the researchers got this group to, uh, together and they did a profile on them assessing things about, okay, so how long have they been doing this? What's their family or friendship support system look like? And one of the categories that they measured with this group was what's their um, distress tolerance? What's their distress tolerance? In other words, how, how can they handle, how can they endure um, uncomfortable, uncomfortable or distressing situations. And at the end of the study, as they started moving forward with these people and helping them with their goal of quitting using pot, that category became the primary factor that determined whether they succeeded or they failed. In fact, 63% of the people who had low tolerance for distress started using again in the very first day. 63% of them. Why? Because they couldn't tolerate this, the withdrawal symptoms. It got uncomfortable. It got real. It got hard. And they couldn't, because they couldn't tolerate the distress, they went back to using. First day. Right? And the same thing's true of us. Paul says, I'm praying for you, not that life is going to go swimmingly and you're going to be victorious in everything you do. No, I'm praying for you that you'll be strengthened with God's might so that you can have patience and long-suffering. That's the word, that, the, the, another translation of that word. It's long-suffering. You need to be able to put up with stuff that's uncomfortable for long enough so that you can move along this process of conversion. Because you're going to have opportunity time after time to make this lazy Susan pivot back toward dark coping um, behaviors, activities that are just, I'm going to fix this impulsively. I'm going to, this is, you know, this person's hurt me. I'm going to retaliate. I'm going to cut them off. I'm going to do whatever it is. And yet God says to forbear with people, to live with people, live in the discomfort of that relationship that's just kind of weird and awkward long enough so that something can be done in you. Does that make sense? And, and, and the less stress and, and emotional pain uh, tolerance that the church becomes, the less able we are to really live in that process of conversion. I have to stay in stuff. Started in, my, my wife decided, and I agreed with her, that uh, I think the second week of January, we said, okay, we're going to cut out sugar, 
And for those of you who know me, Jack, I'm Jack, and I'm a chocoholic, right? So that's, that's a big thing. So cut out sugar, low-carb diet, and portion control. Those three things. So we didn't do the whole keto or Weight Watchers or whatever. We just did. We're just going to be smart and do no sugar, low-carb, portion control. And so now for three months, we've been on this. And so the beginning stages of dieting has most of you know, is hell, right? Right? Because your body is telling you, you don't have enough food. And as I went through that process of those first couple of weeks, of like, man, that's all I get for dinner? And my body and my brain telling me I'm not full yet. I had to sit in that discomfort long enough for my body to catch up. And I, I overate at a, a recent gathering and paid for it because it's like my body has adjusted. They, I don't know if, the, if it's a real thing that your stomach shrinks. I don't know if that's true or if that's a, an old wives tale. But anyway, I, I require less food. But it took three months to get to the point to where I require less food. I was also using food as emotional fuel or to, to get me at that, uh, I was using sugar to do this, that, that two o'clock in the afternoon nosedive into fatigue, well, I had a drawer full of goodies in my office. And I'd grab a cup of coffee, and it's like, yes, this is great. And I'd grab something sugary and sweet, and, and I'd, I'd use that to be able to get through. Well, the coffee had more enduring results, but the sugar was like, it, it, it's a witch, right? Because it like, it pumps you up for like 20 minutes and then it slaps you in the face. <laughs> so that whole process has been this, I've had to mentally put into my head, it's like, okay, I'm suffering, but this is worth it. This may not feel good, but it will do good. Some of you needed to come to church to hear that today. This, that you're facing, this spiritual decision you're having to make, this stand that you're having to take in your faith, this awkward place of living in a relationship with somebody who's broken and yet still staying present and concerned and available to them, that place may not feel good, but it will do good. It will. That's the trust that we have in Christ, right? That we are people who have received his salvation. We have this brand new heart, this inclination toward the Lord, but I've got to participate in this process of conversion, and that is going to require a higher tolerance for stress and for shouldering emotional pain. If that were not true, Paul would have said, I'm praying that everything would just work out well for you in every single way. But he said, no, I'm praying for you that God's might and strength would be delivered into your life in what form? To give you endurance, long-suffering, and patience. long-suffering and patience. So those things are a part of this process of conversion. If we're going to walk into and move into the good that God has in mind for us, if we're going to uh, see that repair of our relationship with God, our relationship in our own identity, and our relationship with others, we're going to be called to live in places in relationships with people or making personal choices that are going to sit awkwardly in your soul. They're going to cause some emotional pain. They are going to be resisted from other people outside of your life. They'll be resisted from your internal, your own internal dialogue. It's going to militate against them. People will co-conspire with you to get you out of pain as quickly as possible. They'll support your impulsive fixes. Well, yeah, you ought to write that person out of your life, for goodness sakes. They've been that evil to you. 
they will co-conspire with you about your self-comfort. Now come over to my house. We're, gonna, we're just going to eat brownies and watch some Hallmark movies. It's going to be great. You just, need, you, just, you just need a vacation, for goodness sakes. Just get out of town for a while. All of those impulsive fixes, all of those self-comforting activities are going to fight against the process of conversion in you. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so Paul says, we pray that you will be strengthened, and here's a promise, with all of God's glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. God is intending to deliver that in your life. And I've talked about this for a number of years in this way that, and, I'll, and then I'm going to finish. And I'm going to, I'm, the, the plane is coming in for a landing. The landing gear is down. <laughs> the second time today, <laughs> the landing gear is down. <laughs> Maybe it should have happened in this message about 20 minutes ago. But the landing gear is down. Okay, so we're, we're coming in. So uh, I've talked about this for a, a number of years in, in this light that there is in, um, and now I've lost my train of thought because I got distracted with the landing gear. <laughs> okay, so, um, so often our prayers then create, your, our, your prayers will create the orientation of your expectations. So if you say to God, God, you have to fix this, and you have to make this better, you have to get me out of this difficult situation right now, that sets up your expectation of that's what God's going to do. And as long as I'm looking that direction and looking for God to produce that in my life and getting disappointed because he's not changing it, he hasn't changed that person, he hasn't wiped them off the face of the planet, he hasn't moved them to a different city, he hasn't made this burden easier to bear, right? Right? He hasn't removed the problem. So as long as I sit there looking for that, I'm going to miss what God is providing that, of what he intends to provide. So he's intending to provide strength. His power is being expressed to bring about patience in my life and to supply the ability for me to endure. But I'm looking here. But if you start praying for this, God, I'm not praying for circumstances you, some of you have heard that thing. So don't pray for patience, right? So, yeah, don't pray for patience. Pray for God's strength so that you can be patient under difficulties. Pray for God's strength to be delivered into your life to give you the ability to suffer for a long time. Because then when you pray that direction, your expectation's here, and that's the kind of prayer that God's going to answer. Right? So... So here's the application. Number one, recover the heart of a learner. If you've stopped reading, start reading again, for goodness sakes. And you can listen to podcasts, you can listen to sermons online, you can do all that stuff, but there's nothing that replaces reading for yourself. There's something intellectually, there's something cognitively that you're gaining in reading words on a page that cannot be replaced by anything else. Audible learning is not as effective, and it doesn't trigger parts of your brain that, that visual reading, words on paper, can do. So, read. And for goodness sakes, read this, right? Read this. So, recover the heart of a learner. Number two, pray for God's strength and might to fortify you in patience and long-suffering. So, um, and then three... Pray for wisdom to know the will of God in situations you must endure versus other situations where there's no higher purpose being served in the suffering. So there's sometimes, and I've, as I pastored, I um, actually early on, it was all females, and then later on, and in my pastoral experience, I started counseling and praying with uh, males who were being emotionally or physically abused in relationships. And if you're in an emotionally or a physical abu physically abusive relationship, God does not want to make you a martyr there. There's nothing that pleases God about you standing up in a place or staying in a place where you're being, you're being physically abused. There's nothing good about that. 
So you need to have wisdom. There's some things where it's like, well, I'm just shouldering up under this. This is a cross that Jesus gave me to bear. Did Jesus give you that cross? Right? So there's some, there's some wisdom and discernment that needs to be developed. How do we develop that wisdom and discernment? We read this book. Okay? So pray for the wisdom to know the will of God in your situations. And then the last one, enjoy the joy. The last thing that Paul says in that uh, 12th verse is he says, um, what is it? He says, he, uh, he says, may, or at the end of verse 11, he says, may you be filled with joy. That's the promise of this, that there is joy that will come out of the re reward of patience and endurance is joy. Joy in having endured, joy that you have served God's pleasure, joy in God's delight in you as a son or daughter that has recovered more of the good he intended for you from the very start of everything. Amen? Amen. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your counsels. And uh, thank you, Lord, for being uh, guiding us on sure paths. I pray, Lord, that you would give uh, for those that are, are, uh, have gotten a little lazy in their um, learning, that you would inspire a heart of a learner, that we would reject this cultural idea that I don't need instruction, I just need to have experiences. And would you give us a greater appetite for truth, for your word, for knowledge, for wisdom, for understanding? Um, let those be the foundations of our life. Father, would you um, strengthen those here today that are suffering under um, difficulties? Would you give them the, the tolerance of endurance and patience to be able to uh, let that process work out to the point to where they, just, they can experience the joy of having come through it, having trusted you, having grown in their faith? And Lord, would you also give discernment to those that are in places where you have not called them to. This is just a part of the hazards of living with uh, reckless, harmful people, or this is a situation that we are not called to stay, to stay in. Would you give us wisdom to know the difference, to discern in those situations? And we ask all this in Christ's mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. Sorry, that was like a lot. But go, go, yeah, bless you. Bless you, have a great day.